hundred years ago on the plains of the far west, a basic principle of military science was proven again. The principle is simple. Victory goes to the side whose ability to move and to shoot are most equally balanced. Before the First World War, the horse provided all the tactical mobility the army needed. But then, the balance changed abruptly. The soldier needed a faster means of moving from place to place in order to keep up with his own increased firepower. Thus, mechanization was born. Tanks were seen on the battlefield. Trucks replaced wagons. And airplanes were first tried as combat vehicles. Between the two world wars, the army was not quick to mechanize. There was no pressing need to. And the modernization of a fighting force was a costly business, even in the days when a dollar was worth a dollar. Then, Adolf Hitler triggered off a whole new concept of moving and shooting. same old story. He had found a better balance between firepower and mobility at a faster pace with a harder punch. By the end of World War II, we had come far down the road toward mechanization. Reconnaissance, the search for information, had accelerated because mobility had been improved, and our soldier was again able to move as fast as he could shoot. The Army does a good job of moving on roads and highways, or even without them. Truck convoys can average 20 to 30 miles an hour. Track vehicles are almost as fast. But when this happens, 30 miles an hour may become 5 miles an hour or no miles an hour. In combat, there are many things beside traffic jams and detours that can slow down the flow of critically needed supplies. But take the most optimistic point of view, that we could keep our trucks rolling at 20 or 30 miles an hour in combat. Let's face it, the next war, if it comes, won't be a 20 or 30 mile an hour war. firepower available to the army today is tremendous and we must assume that our potential enemies have just as much firepower as we have. We don't have to assume that they outnumber us. We know that they can put several well-trained men in the field for every one of ours. To face this threat, we must find a way to make our fighting force superior to theirs. How will we do this? One way, mobility through the air. The air which has no mud holes or traffic jams, roadblocks or bridges. The army must take to the air, not the air 20,000 feet up or even 2,000 feet up but the air just above the treetops, or better yet, between the trees.
Army aviation has many different functions, but all of them are part of the land battle. All of them are designed purely and simply to help the combat soldier win on the battlefield. Though soldiers have taken to the air, they remain just as much a part of the infantry, artillery, or armor as they were before becoming aviation specialists. The Army's aircraft are simply a better and faster means of moving from one place to another and getting a job done. Today's helicopter is not the ultimate all-purpose air vehicle that the Army is seeking, but it has many points in its favor. It can land in cramped quarters and maintain close contact with soldiers on the ground. The Army's larger helicopters are equally versatile. They are flown night and day to teach Army aviators the tactics and techniques for our airmobile future. Army fixed-wing aircraft also have a high degree of maneuverability, and each of them has been chosen because it is rugged and can live in the field with the troops it serves. All of them are capable of landing on very short and rough fields. They are designed to take off with a brief run over very steep barriers. support to our troops, many techniques have been devised by Army aviators. Paradrop of supplies is an old story. So is the laying of wire from fixed wing planes. But one of the newer jobs for aviation is in collaboration with the Missile Command. The Honest John rocket is air transportable, so is its launching equipment. Thus, in a matter of minutes, a critically needed rocket can be hauled to a launching site and fired. Army aviation is not a new way of fighting. It is just a faster and more efficient way of getting troops and their weapons to the scene of battle, and a faster and more efficient way to acquire tactical information for the ground commander. Let's see how an attack might be made on a hypothetical battlefield using the aircraft which the Army has today. First, we will go to a command post where the key officers of a division are being briefed. Now let's emphasize one more point here, gentlemen. Helicopters are arriving tomorrow at 0530 hours, the 18th. They'll land in the respective areas which we've already designated. Aircraft will be ready for loading immediately upon landing. Precisely at 5.30, the Choctaws fly in from the division's base airfield. Smoke pots mark the pickup site, and each pilot knows exactly where to touch down. Fresh from a good night's sleep and a hot breakfast, our troops will arrive at their battle site 20 or 30 miles away with a full head of steam, not with their keen edge dulled by an exhausting march. Meanwhile, jeep-mounted heavy weapons are loaded aboard powerful Mojaves to be carried directly to the battle area. Choctaws are picking up their loads. They can easily carry a jeep with a recoilless rifle. Now the troop carriers are off, each with its load of fully equipped fighting men.
Over the attack objective, a forward observer is directing a continual barrage to soften up the enemy's resistance. From his flying observation post, the observer prepares to lift the artillery fire. He sees a reconnaissance patrol armed with machine guns and rockets coming in right on schedule. They proceed to a pre-planned position just behind the cover of a hill then rise above the protecting ridge to sweep the area. Shortly, the leader of this armed reconnaissance party calls the next turn. Armed Choctaws, flying gun platforms, come in to complete the softening up process with a barrage of rockets. Troop carriers near the battle area, winging over terrain obstacles impassable for troops on the ground. The troops are ready, their tension mounting as the moment of combat approaches. Another flight of armed Choctaws holds the enemy down. They give the first wave of helicopter-borne infantry a free and unchallenged minute or two to pile out and organize. This is Army aviation paying off. Our men are landed practically on their objective, fresh and ready to go. Their vehicles are set down beside them, equipped with weapons and with radios that will tie the attack together and give the battle commander a clear line back to higher headquarters. Troops press forward, the Mojaves come in. Before the battle has hardly begun, a mechanical mule brings out a reserve of small arms ammunition, followed by more jeep mounted recoilless rifles to reinforce the attack. Flying over the area, a battle surveillance observer keeps tabs on the enemy. Information is thus gained on enemy strong points, reinforcements, and gun emplacements. A running commentary on the course of battle is available to the ground commander, giving him an extra pair of all-seeing eyes. The troops push forward toward their initial objective. While the armed helicopters have replenished their ammunition and are covering the advancing soldiers. Our troops near their objective and set up fields of fire. The aggressor has anticipated the attack and has saved a Sunday punch for the infantry. Battle commander quickly figures the odds. The attack must not stall. He has an ace in the hole and he uses it. 
He radios directly to the commander of his reserve force, telling him to bring more troops forward in fixed wing planes to an assembly point for helicopter delivery to the battle scene. is the Otter, a plane that is designed to live with the infantry and to be as reliable as an aircraft can be. It carries nine troops and all of their gear. Army aviators can bring them into places where the average pilot would not consider trying to land an aircraft of this size. Choctaw Air Ferry continues its shuttle, bringing more equipment and the reserves who were delivered to the assembly area in Otters. As the attack continues, our tanks break through and join the assault. No battle is without casualties, but our Mojaves are ready. Within minutes, our wounded will be in rear area hospitals receiving life-saving medical attention. And now, at full fighting strength, the division surges forward. In the critical final attack, the flying soldiers still have an extra bonus of energy and will to win. determination is broken. The victory is ours. The use of elevated gun platforms is one of the most promising new ground warfare techniques in many years. Here, testing this impressive new concept for himself is Major General Bugs Cairn. Commandant of the Army Aviation Center at Fort Rucker, Alabama. Let's ask him a few questions. General Cairns, isn't it somewhat unique for a major general to take part in an exercise of this kind? Well, I'm not really participating in this exercise. I'm flying this Sioux and firing its weapons so that I'll really know what we are able to do with armed helicopters at this stage of the game. Are you satisfied with what you've learned, General Cairns? I'm more than satisfied. I'm enthusiastic. While we've been doing a lot of experimenting at the Army Aviation Center with Sky Cavalry, or Aerial Combat Reconnaissance concept, you don't really grasp the significance of this new way of fighting until you've done it yourself. The speed, versatility, and effectiveness that you gain by being free of ground obstacles but still an intimate contact with the ground is tremendous. How do you think the Army can use this new fighting technique, General? We have a lot of ideas on the fire. One of the best, I think, is the Aerial Combat Reconnaissance Company. This unit will be completely air-mounted with armed helicopters and infantry troops mounted in transport helicopters. The company will have additional transport helicopters to move gasoline, ammunition, and food. This air cavalry outfit would be completely mobile, able to operate without considering the terrain or land obstacles. Then we gather, General, that you feel that the helicopter is in the Army to stay. Let's put that another way. The air vehicle is in the Army to stay. Our present helicopters are good, 
but we have new vehicles in development which should prove to be even better. Thanks very much, General Cairns. We're going to look at some of these new aircraft right now. While the Army continues its training and planning, let's visit several aircraft plans for a look into tomorrow. First, we'll go to Fort Worth, Texas, where the Iroquois helicopter is being built. This is the first aircraft designed specifically for Army use, and the first helicopter designed to use a gas turbine engine. It represents a significant breakthrough in the state of helicopter development. mobility in the battlefield will be greatly improved, for it has been built as a many-purpose vehicle. It will serve as a stable and agile platform from which to deliver fire. It will transport troops, keep them supplied, and speed them to a hospital. Long Island is the Mohawk, a new airplane being built especially for Army observation, used to help the ground commander locate targets on the fast-moving battlefield of tomorrow. Unlike other Army aircraft, the Mohawk's pilot and engines have armor protection against enemy ground fire. Both the pilot and co-pilot have an excellent view of the ground beneath the Mohawk. This is an important feature for low-altitude, high-speed observation. Ejection seats will make it possible for the pilot and observer to get out of the plane safely in an emergency from the extremely low altitudes at which they will be flying. It is to be equipped with the latest in navigation equipment and will be capable of flying day or night in almost any weather. Facilities for aerial cameras are built into the fuselage. The cameras are operated remotely from the cockpit. When pictures are taken, this outer panel opens and closes automatically. Aft of the camera compartment is a large area where electronic components are installed. The Mohawk will be an ideal vehicle for the new television, radar, and infrared surveillance equipment that is being developed by the Army. Perhaps the best feature of this relatively sophisticated Army aircraft is its ingenious arrangement of flaps and ailerons, which makes it possible to land and take off on short, unimproved strips. Here in Philadelphia is a vehicle which is in its first stage of development. It takes off as a helicopter, then tilts its wings and propellers forward and becomes a conventional airplane. The tilt wing had undergone months of testing before the early morning in July 1958 when the first transition from vertical to horizontal configuration was tried. All indications pointed toward success, but it had never been done before. Aviation history was made that morning. The transition was perfect. There is every reason to believe that within a few years, the Army aviator will be able to take off vertically from a small clearing then fly with the speed and fuel economy of a conventional airplane to a landing site no larger than his tilt wing's length and width. Next to Toronto, Canada, 
to see the first flying model of the caribou. Here is Brigadier General Ernest F. Easterbrook, Director of Army Aviation, inspecting the new plane. Several caribous will be purchased by the Army for testing as a battlefield troop and cargo carrier. Let's watch with General Easterbrook as the caribou is put through its paces. The most remarkable feature of the caribou is its extremely short takeoff and landing ability. Watch this. The caribou will be capable of carrying 28 combat troops. With this load, it can fly close to 400 miles without refueling. Thus, as an air ferry, a single caribou will be able to haul hundreds of men short distances without refueling. It will operate in rough country without prepared strips. For this 10-ton plus airplane requires only 500 feet from touchdown to a full stop. future of Army Aviation. The 15,000 soldiers who are directly involved in Army Aviation today, they are working to improve the balance between firepower and movement so that tomorrow's war, if it comes, will find our side with the advantage. Army Aviation is more than a new weapon. It multiplies the effectiveness of every weapon we have now and those we will have in the future. How soon our flying soldiers can realize the advantages which aviation can provide depends on our ability to develop this potential and to acquire the air vehicles to do the job.